All right, let's quickly discuss education. It is sad to note that negative developmental indices in Nigeria continue to rise, while the positive ones keep news diving. The United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization said Nigeria now has about 20 million out-of-school children. According to the latest global data on out-of-school children by UNESCO, there are 244 million children and youths between the ages of 6 and 18 out of school worldwide. But India, Nigeria and Pakistan have in the highest figure. How did we get here, uh, Mr. Chris? Hmm. Well, I, I want to add that we should also add the university students, university students that are at home. <laughs> For about six, seven months, a part of that figure, or it should, I expect to, be, to have increased. Uh, because we are talking of children, but our youth has also been out of school for close to, close to six, six months. months now, so they should be added. I don't even believe that figure is right. It should be more than that, because that is just what they are cultured. But how do we get here? Every year, irrespective of the fact that we're having dwindling um, fortune when it comes to economy and what we are doing, the World Health Organization has a standard, and UNICEF have a standard, as a percentage to be allocated for education and health, mm. go and check in the last 20 years whether Nigeria has ever met that. We have never. We have not come anything close to it. So what do you expect? Then recently, uh, with the issue of the Amajaris in the north, the former uh, president tried to come into terms by establishing certain schooling within the northern area to be able to cater for most of these students that are uh, out of school. But after he left office, that was also cancelled. I was in Bauchi State some years ago, about two, three years ago. And most of these kids you are seeing on the screen here mm. were what I saw in the north. No part of the north. Kanu, Kaduna, Kasina, Bauchi, name it. Everywhere. Children of this, you just see them in the morning. In fact, it got to a point that I wanted to make an attempt. Somebody just won, I shouldn't. I wanted to buy some loaves of bread to just give. By the time I bought about five and tried to give out, if you see the way they converge on that mm. food and the rest of them. And I continue to ask, what, is the, what are the government, this government, the state government in this northern part of the country, what are they doing about this? What are they doing about education? You continue to see the decline in the area of um, enrollment into primary schools and secondary schools. Look at the Wayek Resort and see what is coming from the north. Except for one or two states in the north that is doing very, very well. The other states don't seem to be clear. And I continue to act because some of these children are just, they are time bombs. That is why it is very easy for um, um, all these uh, terrorists and the rest of them to recruit them and use them. Because as we say, um, an idle hand is it, the devil's uh, a workshop. So, but we can still do more. A country that refused to invest in education is doomed. And it's so surprising to me that India, I was, I was shocked to see India. In that bracket, because I know that India as a nation invests so much in education. But whether they are getting it right or not is a problem. Um, every other country, I, I was looking at the statistics over the uh, some few <coughs> yesterday or so. If you see what countries like Rwanda and smaller nations in Africa are doing in terms of education, at a point, I realized that a country like Rwanda has close to about 70 to 80 percent literacy rates compared to Nigeria. And you're asking if those con such countries should be having that, what's happening? And the most unfortunate part of it is that most of our leaders today, we are people that benefited from free education. Mm. And you expect that they know better and know the importance of education, but they're not doing that. Today, the federal government is asking um, um, students to go and beg us to resume. The Minister of Education is asking students to sue ASU <laughs> for not resuming. Then you can just ask yourself, what is the mindset of our leader? It's quite unfortunate. All right, Bikil. Now, let me corroborate um, Chris's stance. Out of 17 states in the country with the highest number of out-of-school children, 14 are in the north. Mm -hmm. Can we totally blame insecurity for this? It's, um, it's obvious. The insecurity, the problem of insecurity in our country is largely 
felt in the north. Look at the southwest. The southwest is the most secure geopolitical zone in our country. When the Americans issue their periodic uh, travel advisory, they don't tell people not to go to the southwest because they know that the southwest is the most peaceful, most secure geopolitical zone in our country. You look at the states of the Northwest, there are seven states. Out of the seven, is only Kano and to a little extent, Jigawa states that you can say are safe. The rest of them are facing serious problems of banditry. That's already five states. Talking about the North Central, there is no state in the North Central today that you can actually say is safe. Kwara used to be safe to an extent, but we are seeing the incursion of terrorists and kidnappers now in, into Kwara State. Where schools are deemed insecure, Definitely, definitely, people will be reluctant to go to school, to send their children to school. Children must feel comfortable, must feel safe to go to school and return home safely. But between December 2020 and now, 11,000 schools have been shut, largely in the northwest of our country and in the northeast. Why? Because governments have picked up valuable lessons from what happened in 2014, April 2014, when Boko Haram invaded Tibok and made away with more than 200 uh, students. You've seen students kidnapped in Zamfara. You've seen students kidnapped in Kasina. You've seen students kidnapped, even university students kidnapped in Kaduna. So how will people feel comfortable to send their schools, their children to schools? Mm -hmm. A lot of the schools in the rural areas have even been shot because government cannot guarantee the security of students in those schools. A lot of the schools in Bono State have been shot and the students have been moved to the state capital. The federal government gets college in an extreme end of the state, was moved to the state capital. They didn't want to lose the unity school, so they moved them to, that's Monguno, they moved them to the state capital. So more and more Students have been targeted, not just by Boko Haram, but by bandits. Mm. So parents are worried. They don't want to send those children to school where they will eventually be kidnapped. So it has worsened. You can see in the past, we were dealing with 13.5 million out-of-school out of children. children. Mm. But by May this year, UNICEF told us that that figure had risen to 18.5 million. Today, we are being told that it's actually now 20 million. So, apart from the insecurity in the North that worsens things, even down south, the cost of education is difficult for many parents to bear. Government has to help them to pay white fees, pay for jam, you know? And for a lot of these students, once they pass through uh, uh, primary school, there won't be money for them to even uh, take a step further to secondary school. A lot of them stop after primary school. Some stop after secondary school because parents can't afford the fees. So it's been suggested that, look, make education free at certain level so that people can take advantage of that. But in a season in which we cannot even fund our tertiary 
public tertiary institutions and we are creating new ones. How do you convince government to stop taking tuition fees even for a primary, I mean, for, for secondary schools? How do you convince uh, government? It's, it, it's such a, a, a difficult thing, but this is a problem that we have to address. Even in Lagos states, they have this problem. You must build more schools to take care of the teaming population of our people who want to go to school and make the environment conducive. Dilapidated structures, make them better so that students will enjoy going to school. The environment has to be inviting. The situation in which students are sitting on the floor, even in some of our, our, our states, including Lagos, you see students sitting on the floor to receive uh, instruction. It, it does not encourage enrollment. They must come up with uh, incentives that will help us improve the enrollment figure and get more and more uh, of these uh, children of the streets. Um, the figure is coming from um, not a political organization, it's coming from uh, one of the most reputable institutions in the world. So like Baba Gide said, we are even talking of 10 million, or the UNICEF came with 18.5 million. But UNESCO is telling us that they are, they are using, for the first time, multiple sources mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to arrive at this at figure. Mm -hmm. So it is almost 90% accurate. And we are being classed in the same category with uh, Pakistan, oh, you? you know, with uh, Congo in Africa, Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. If you look at Ethiopia and Congo, they have one kind of crisis, you know, more or less at the state of war. In fact, Congo has been in a state of perpetual war, where Eritrea for the past three years has been fighting uh, Tigray, you know. So we don't think we have war in our country, though there's terrorism. Mm -hmm. But we are being put in the same category with, the, you know, these other countries. And uh, if you look at it very well, we need to look for practical solutions. And I think one of those solutions is that we need to return back to public schools. Because that is the only way children from poor homes can have access to education. We should learn from what our leaders did in the past. The essence of public schools is to ensure that children from all classes, all backgrounds, we have share that. ideas together, live together for at least about six years. So if you are, your, your, your father is a commissioner or prime minister, you see somebody's father is a hunter who comes to school without shoes, you begin to learn about what poverty is all about. So in future, if you end up becoming a state governor as a son of a minister, you appreciate what poverty is all about. But we have killed that system. We now have a system whereby children of the rich will go to private school from in primary school, secondary school, university, up to university abroad, and mm -hmm. come back to run the affairs of the state. So they don't appreciate the problems the people are going through. What did our law do in 1952? He introduced free and compulsory education. They could not fund it. What did they do? They introduced what they call sort tax, because everybody must eat uh, sort. And between 1952 and 1954, with 400,000 students, they were able to kickstart free education. So when you are talking about Southwest is stable, is developed, it is that foundation that was laid. I was spent just eight years. But today, everybody is talking about him. He left power when he was almost about 50 years. So we need to go back to uh, public education, I mean public schools. Then priority in terms of our, how our government spends money. You have a state with 300 traditional rulers. When you come to power, the first thing is that you buy cars for all of them, 10, 10 million. For a traditional ruler in the community where the primary school is just looking for 1 million to buy furniture. Then members of the House of Assembly, you buy cars, 20, 20 million for all of them. Then you have public schools that are just looking for just one million to buy furniture. So we need to change our priority. Because what we are doing is that we are building monsters that will rise up against us in the future, if we are not careful. We are building a pool where terrorists will recruit, you know, we find very easy to recruit, you know, to endanger our lives. Once there is threat to stability anywhere, it's a threat to stability everywhere. So this problem is our problem, and we must address it in a practical and meaningful way. All right, so uh, Mr. Chris, talking about how expensive education is in Nigeria, what can the government actually do about this? Well, um, a lot subsidize. You just have to learn how to subsidize. It's not just petroleum. We are spending 
in the wrong areas. And that is the problem. Education is key. Anybody that is coming or that is going to assure me that he will handle the education sector in Nigeria, I will vote for the person. That is if he's sincere. <laughs> why, why am I saying this? Let me give a practical example. All, my, all through my secondary school in Lagos State, my parents didn't pay a dime. I went to Ojota Secondary School. From Ojota Secondary School, I went to Bubi College. My parents never paid a dime. From there, I moved to invest. I moved to Lagos State University. All my schools are schooled in Lagos. In, at Lagos State University, I never paid, my parents never paid a dime during our time. I was in Lasso between 1986 and 1990. Apart from this, we were just paying, we were just paying about 100 or 98 or whatever. Do you know what that did to us? So many people went to school. So many of the top young men you are seeing across Nigeria now went to those free education schools. They were able to, in fact, so many that parents that couldn't afford their children to go to school had their children in the university. And what happened today? I, I'm here talking. If no, nobody tells you that I went to uh, King's College or whatever, mm -hmm. all, all those so called uh, uni, uh, colleges that we are mentioning in those days, I am a proud student of Latif Jakonde. They used to call us uh, Jakonde schools. You used to call mm -hmm. them Jakonde schools in those days. But look at us today. With those that went to the so-called uh, high school, all of us are in it together. And that is why someone like, we, we were talking about, uh, someone like Latif Jakonde can never ever be forgotten. Because when he came into government, he realized the problem. And he knows that building all the so-called mansion and rest of might not be able to, what did he do? He went into a situation where he built just what they were called, they called the poetry schools. We just had a zinc and have blocks. But we were learning, and the teachers were there. It was made compulsory. Before then, 1979 to 80, when we started, we used to have what was called the morning and afternoon session. When I was at Nigerian College in 1979, I was attending Nigerian College, at afternoon session. That was morning, that was afternoon, that was evening session. Latif Jaconde came and abolished it and built all these schools. Free schools and people moved in. And today, that is the best. most of those that our leaders today benefited from that. They wouldn't have been what they are today if they didn't benefit from that. Mm. So many of them, they, you see them boasting now. Uh, I didn't have shoe. I didn't have sandal. I didn't have uh, head cap and the rest of them. <laughs> you didn't have shoe. You didn't have sandal. You didn't have leg. But you were able to go to school. What of those students now that don't also have shoes, sandal, and the rest of them? Whose parents cannot be able to afford education? What are you doing to better their lives? Instead, they're starting the funds, keeping some abroad, some that game. We're not even, they and their own children, children cannot finish. And for granted, the fact that, in us, you know why the rich is, is, is not mm -hmm. sleeping? Because the poor is awake. Once the poor is awake, the rich cannot sleep. So whether you like it or not, there is insecurity. There is this. You that used to think that you can move from your village before with all the routines of security, you can't go there now. It's not possible. As if they touch poor man, and so they touch big man. So our government should do the needful. This is a wake up call for mm -hmm. us. It's 20 million today. If care is not taken, in the next two years, it might run into 40 million, and we continue running into this problem. All right, uh, Bikio, your final take on this, especially because uh, this is quite worrisome, majorly because it does not even look like the government is ready to invest in education. We are unable to even meet the. Mm. UNESCO recommendation uh, in terms of the percentage of the budget that should go into education. Uh, this year, or the next year's budget, we budgeted 5%. And we see some countries do as much as 15%. You know? UNESCO expects us to be able to do between 12.5 to 15 percent, and we are doing 5 percent. It shows the level of importance that we attach to education. So if you are budgeting 5 percent of your budget to education, where are you going to find the funds, uh, the funds to improve the quality of instruction in those schools, to improve even the quality of infrastructure in the schools. And there is no magic. The World Bank has given us all kinds of suggestions on how we can stop this, um, this out-of-school children syndrome or even reduce it. And 
one of the things they've told us to do is to make the environment more conducive, improve security. Lord Jonathan came up with the safe school project. How far have we gone? How safe are those schools, especially in the Northeast, the North, uh, North Central, especially Niger, and the uh, Northwest? If the schools are not kept safe, there is no way we will be able to address uh, this problem. We have to also reduce the cost of education. Many of our leaders today were products of free education. When I was in school, we were paying 90 naira per annum. 90 naira, not 90,000, no. University of Illinois in that time. 90, and I would, that was, I, 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 I didn't squat. I was a proud uh, um, landlord. I had my room for just 90 naira in the whole year. 90 naira. People will find it uh, unbelievable, they will think it's a lie. <laughs> but as I used to say, or oh, as, I, as I always say, Nigeria has been very good in the past. What we want to see is for the current generation to even witness a beautiful Nigeria. And that's why we keep appealing to government to take steps that will make our country better. Ease the pain that the young people are going through. Let them feel that this is a country for them. More and more people are going out. I'm going to lose two staff in my department, as small as my department is. I'm going to lose two staff. And both of them are going abroad. You know? And the third person will probably join them after about three months. Nobody wants to stay here. Japan. Those who can uh, uh, go abroad. Thank you, Mikhail. So, <laughs> the country better. Was sad reality. All right.